So, as we all learned that uh, robotic surgery was approved for gynecology in 2005, and we acquired robot in 2007. And it's exciting to get new tool, it's a new tool. And, but we also had, in the beginning I was doing all the studies related to what is the cost of abdominal surgery versus the robotic surgery. Because our goal was to convert robotic, abdominal to robotic, not laparoscopy to robotic, not vaginal to robotic, but what is the conversions. If you do the abdominal to robotic, what is the cost effectiveness? And I think about three years ago when we came here, that's what I presented at the time, was we looked at it and our cost for abdominal surgery versus the robotic hysterectomy was similar because there's inpatient cost that goes with the abdominal hysterectomy, whereas with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, robotics, cost of doing surgery is higher, but then the rest of the cost is lower because they're going home much earlier. So then since then I have decided that we are looking at this became converted into our, outpatient surgeries. With outpatients, our reimbursements went down. So my passion was really how do we change the dynamics of the cost? Can we make the cost closer to the laparoscopy surgery? And you know, if you look at all the literature, you know, even the latest literature in October 2014, in Green Journal, they had a big database. And the database, they looked at it, and robotic surgery is about $2,500 more than laparoscopy surgery. So why should we do it? That's the question. So my thing was, I was looking at the other way. And if we're going to do a lot of robotic surgeries, how do we bring the robotic surgery costs down? That, that's the whole process here. This is our team. Uh, we have, uh, like I said, we have a lot of physician assistants, surgeons, uh, and urologists, and colorectal. So we call it as robotic surgery team. And this is Providence Vatikuti. Mr. Vatikuti actually, we had robot before Mr. Vatikuti was involved in our institute. And, but then uh, the second robot was acquired with, uh, with uh, Mr. Vatikuti's involvement. So the advantage of dual control is really when we have residency training, you don't want them to sit at the console and I'm shaking my hands trying to make sure they're doing the right thing. And, you're trying to, telestration is not perfect when you mark it one set, there's always two to three millimeter difference. And so because of that, you know, you're telling them to do cut here and they're cutting somewhere else and you're scared to death. And anybody on the other side, you know, understand it. So dual, we have the SI, so we do have dual control um, uh, robot. So at Providence Hospital, you know, as you know, it was in 2000 that was approved for prostate surgery. And in 2005, it was approved for gynecology surgery by FDA. And we acquired it in 2007, less than two years. I, the reason why we got involved was because I went to University of Michigan and I looked at this and I came back and I told my hospital administrator, I said, we've got to have it not because that it is a new technology, it's mainly we would convert most of our abdominal surgeries into minimally invasive, and that's a great service to the woman women and women's um, uh, uh, surgical outcomes. So that's how I was able to convince them to pay for a couple of million dollars. That's not an easy task. So after 2007, we went with the same one robot for about four years, and we were doing about 380 cases with one robot per year. Now in 2011, we acquired the second robot. Now we do over 600 plus cases per year, robotic surgery in our own hospital. So in 2012 is when we got the second major. So we got the, we talked about Global Vaticuti Institute. In 2013, we have two hospitals in our institution. And so we can divide them and each institution has one robot. And we also have a robot simulator so that there is an independent, we have two simulators. One is in the operating room where the residents can go and train and this is a must that they have to be learn the simulation before they go onto the consoles. But also we have independent simulator where you can go to a lab and where they can learn the simulators. It has its advantages, but it's not as what it's cut out to be. It is like it's a muscle memory simulation. So you kind of learn it through the muscle memory. So what our services in the beginning as we expected to be is robotic urology and gynecology. In 2008, we added colorectal. In 2012, we have bariatrics. 
in 2013, we have general surgery that I have a little bit of a concern with general surgery is mostly with gallbladders and hernias. Though ventral hernia repair, they do convert abdominal to the robotic. I think that has an advantage to it. So we present in 2012, and also I presented a couple of art, a couple of papers, abstracts at World Robotic Conference in Florida in 2012, and also presented an abstract at AAGL in the same year about the costs of abdominal surgery versus the robotic surgery. And I went to Calcutta, and we had the live. Uh, Dr. Gupta is here, so we had a live tele surgery for the Indo GYN conference uh, in 20, I think it's 2012, 2013. And I, like I said, we are what is called Ascension Health, is one of the largest healthcare, I won't call it company, but healthcare organization. It's Catholic based, it's the first number one non profit organization in the country. And I'm involved in the, what is called Affinity Group. There are about 14 gynecologists across the country. We get together, we discuss what, where we are going from here. And every challenge we have, whether it's the oscillation, FTA MOS, we discuss and we kind of hone it down to where do we take the entire healthcare system forward. So you, I'm not going to, you know, it's like preaching the choir here that we all know why minimally invasive surgery, what are the reasons for it. And like I said, uh, it is mainly for the replacement of a traditional abdominal surgery, not the replacement of vaginal and laparoscopy surgery. Though we are all at fault, I can bet on that, that when you learn the robotic surgery, I think sometimes we get into this mode of thinking, doing the things that we used to do vaginally, are the things we used to do laparoscopically, and we kind of go into the robot not even thinking about it. And that is the problem of doing these surgeries, going into new technologies. So I can tell you in our institution, in the beginning of before the robot, we had 75% were done by uh, abdominal approach and 25% by minimally invasive approach. And mainly because of reluctant physicians uh, trying to learn the new techniques and uh, didn't want to spend enough time to learn it. So because of that, that few women received the benefits of minimally invasive surgery and uh, left in the hands of very few uh, skilled laparoscopy surgeons and rest of them were doing abdominal surgery. And one of the things that we learned was robotics definitely is a fast learning curve. It could be because of ergonomics, it could be three-dimensional, it's more you're controlling the camera and the instruments, whereas with laparoscopy, you are not controlling everything. Somebody's holding the camera, somebody's holding the instruments, somebody's manipulating it, and so you need to have a team, and when you have surgeon, residents, then you're always worried about the counterintuitive nature of it itself. It takes a little longer to learn. And of course, the controversy is all related to cost and more expensive than laparoscopy surgery. And there are no really, and Dr. Gupta, uh, Sabita Gupta already said that there are no real clinical advantages of doing robotic surgery over laparoscopy surgery. And we all understand that. So what our goals at our institution was, how do we make them more cost effective? And we want to make sure the optimal patient care with good outcomes and low complication readmission rates. And of course, decrease the length of stay over the abdominal surgery and evaluation of what we call direct and total cost. What for us direct cost is related to what the surgeon contributes in the cost of patient care. Now there are indirect costs that goes into the administration, CEOs, the floor, there are a lot of other costs that has nothing to do with what we do for patient care. So in 2012, I started a project in trying to get all the data collection, and we want to look at the cost. And it's a painful process trying to get all this cost structure into putting into the database. And surgical complications, disposable instrument and supply costs, was surgical time, length of stay, direct and total cost. And we wanted, just doing that is not adequate enough. Most of us as surgeons, we go and we do surgery. I don't know how it is here, but for us, we just go and do surgery because we're not buying the instruments. We have nothing to do with anything. The hospital does all the instrumentation, so we just go and do surgery. We get paid for whatever we have done. You know, that's the physicians get their separate billing, which has nothing to do with the hospital. So because of that, physicians have no really motivation or interest in knowing how much it costs. But in the long run, our healthcare is going to get into what we call as bundled costs, that where it is going to be, they're going to say, you're going to get one payment, you figure out how you're going to divvy it up between the hospitals and the physicians. 
So physicians really don't know how much they're spending on each instrument, what the cost of the instrument, they have no idea. It looks like all of you are very well versed with it, but most of our physicians had no idea of how much it costs. So once we get the database, it is not adequate just to get the data, but we have to communicate them and communicate in timely fashion. In our hospital, we have monthly, what, actually we have every week grand rounds. Grand rounds is educational meetings. Every week we have 60 member department, we have 20 residents. So there's always every week we have an educational meeting. But once a month we have what is called business meeting. Business meeting is all attending physicians, who would come in and we talk about all the important issues that go on. And so I made a plan that we're going to talk about these cost issues every month so they would be educated on a monthly basis. So not only we did the department education, we look at the individual physician data and then look at which physicians are really not utilizing the instrument appropriately and give the individual physician data also. So then we decided to do, then we did it, we got the data, we educate the physicians, and then we say, then we want to see what the data has shown after the education. So West Region means those are the two hospitals. Like I said, we have six big hospitals. We are a big system in the local area. So but our system in the region that I work is called West Region. And you can see in 2011, before we acquiring that second robot, we were doing 381 cases. They're all hysterectomy. They're all robotic gynecologic cases. In uh, 2013, we did 584 cases. It is actually all together, all cases, including the urology and other cases. And so all together so far, we did 1,421 cases in that three-year period. As you can see, in our institution, unlike most of the institutions, gynecology is the leader. Majority of the institutions, generally urology, tend to be the leader in doing the robotic surgeries. You can see we have very minimal volume. They're just starting up a lot of other volumes. Our urology ha volume has gone down because PSAs went down. The number of PSAs uh, being tested, they it really uh, they came up with some task force uh, recommendation. PSAs should not be done on routine basis. That reduced the uh, you know number of cases, and also a lot of them are doing other than surgical options. So our urology volume was not that high. So length of stay, as we expected, is not much. It's like one day, uh, one to 1.12 days. That includes some of these cases have to be admitted to inpatient, mainly because of the some cases are like malignant cases, and they tend to be admitted for a day or two. So as a whole, our number of cases are 1.1 to 1.1 to 1.12 to length of stay. Our, I always look at the war time and surgical time. War time tells us from the time patient walks into the war to the time, I mean, moved into the war to the time they take her out, whereas surgical time is what the surgeon's, you know, time of surgery itself. As you can see, really, there's not a big difference in our surgical times. It is 169 minutes in 2011. By that time, most of our surgeons already acquired the skills that they needed. It's all cases, whether it is mild, moderate, complex, all cases included. And our surgical time now in 2013 is 163 minutes. That's about a little over two and a half hours. So I want to look at the surgical complications. 2011, unfortunately, we had a couple of major complications with vascular injuries, which has nothing to do with robotics. It's really port injuries. That's what happens when you are training the resident Resident sentence, of course, one of the residents went a little too harsh, and two cases happened in a row, and that changed our complication rates. So in uh, total complications, we divide them into major and minor complications. Major are bowel, bladder, vascular, ureter injuries are major. Minor becomes like vaginal bleeding. Um, dehiscence with evisceration, of course, is a major complication. Hernias are major complication. Rest of them are all like little uterine perforations. Uh, they have minimum bleeding, and they came to the emergency room. For whatever reasons, we put them as minor complications. As you can see, our, major, our total complication rate in 2011 was 9.9%. .9%, and when we came down to in, came down to in 2013, it was 2.9%. And I always want everybody to look at the laparotomy conversions too. Because if you have a higher number of laparotomy conversions, your selection of cases is not appropriate. That means either our skill sets are not good enough to do those cases, or 
it could be because we are selecting wrong patients. So that, that's a very important. You have to look at not every 24 week size fibroids you can remove them. Depends upon the torso, the width, and the height of the torso makes a big difference in doing these cases. And of course, multiple previous surgeries, adhesiolysis, most of them we can manage them, but sometimes you can't. So detail of the data complications for benign RAT, LH, you can see all together. I have to tell you, I looked at these um, number of cases. What are the major vascular? We had about two cases over three years. That's the first time that we were talking about in 2011. Those were really port injuries. It has nothing to do with intra-pelvic bleeding. And it was like a, a, the total major vascular complications point to two. I'm not going to go through completely. I'm going to go through the major case, like bladder laceration in our institution is 1%. And bowel injuries are about boy, half a percent. Ureteral injury is about half a percent. And port side hernia, vaginal dehiscence, we are about 0.56%. We were talking about a vaginal dehiscence uh, at, the, at, the, at the larger studies is about 1.65, as you can see in our institution, is much less. And vaginal bleeding and readmissions for the cap, sometimes they bleed enough, they have to have cuff closure. Reclosure of the cuff is about 0.78%. And so once in a while, I don't know what your experience is when we're doing the large uterine uh, hysterectomies and we are trying to deliver this large uterine with coring and all that. Still you can have sometimes vaginal lacerations and we count those as minor, minor complications. So I wanted to compare that to our national data that they produced in October 2014, actually, and say what is our data compared to the national data, and also look at the laparoscopy versus the robot hysterectomy, and then Providence Hospital um, uh, experience. National data for robot hysterectomy complicated. These are major com surgical complications, not the medical complications. His robot is 4.67 percent, whereas in, um, in uh, laparoscopy is 5.33%. And ours is pretty close to what the national data is as far as the complications are concerned for robotic surgery. But if you look at it, we, are, we did it cumulatively over a three-year period. If you look at it, actually, there's a major difference. In the last year or so, our complication rates were significantly less than the national data. The national data is a two-year data. It was really was database collected by the government. And so whatever we put in, they collect it and they put all the data together. And that's how, so it's not a perfect, and no data is a perfect data. I always feel my data is correct because I go through each and individual chart actually. Whereas when you put the data into a database, it is all depends upon the, you know, whatever you put in. Institutions have to put in correct data to get the correct data out. So then, of course, our, our complication rates are at least part of the national complications, and our complication rates are going down uh, compared in the last two years. And then we looked at, hey, how is our costs are coming along? Are we doing, we did all this in our database, we educated our surgeons, actually we give them a list of instruments and what is the cost of it. And these adhesio barriers are very expensive, it's about $250 a shot, each port cost more, each drape cost more, and each instrument cost more. And so how do we reduce the cost, and uh, how many arms do we have to use, even in the most complex cases? As you can see, uh, what I look at, the direct cost is where what we do for the patient care, that is contributed patient, uh, patient care by the physicians. In 2011, we were, our cost was about over 5,000. That's what the most important thing is, what is our cost? And we were spending over $5,000 per case. By the time we came down in 2013, 3699 We cut it down by $1,500 plus in just changing the physician thinking. Not every instrument need, does not need to be used. Not every new port doesn't have to be placed. Not, doesn't have to have, actually we even the vaginal, we, they used to put the trocar through vagina to feed the, we just put the aseptic syringe, that's just one dollar, you know. And so, and endo catch bags, you don't have to use for everyone. When we do the myomectomies for, you know, if you'd want to do a big myoma hysterectomy, we do kind of take them out and put a suture and, you know, tag them and pull them through, through the vagina after doing, taking the uterus out, so you don't have to use a bag. 
and if you, because we have all these fancy bags, and once it comes to the hospital, even the aspirin costs $10, so that generally is a few cents. So, you know, that's what happens in the cost, cost of this, you know, the, the structure and the staff and all that makes, makes a big difference. Not only we did that, our reimbursements, as you can see, in a abdominal hysterectomy, we get over $10,000 for the hospital reimbursements. And for, for a robotic, it went down to 6,000 later because they made it outpatient. Last year, uh, in 2012, it was even a little lower. Then when we made this, and I also talked about documentation, for all the adhesiolysis, all the urethrolysis, you need to document it, and that gives them a little extra reimbursement. So our reimbursement value went up, our cost structure went down, so our profit margin went up. So what we saved in the last two years is about half a million dollars for the hospital. They like it. So we compared that to our national data that they were talking about, and we talked about how robotic surgery costs are about $2,500 more than laparoscopy surgery. Over and over, you look at every article in the country, and every article that you see, robotic surgery is a lot more cost, very expensive compared to, and why are we doing it? So our goal was to not only to prove our hospital that we are doing better, but we want to compare it to the national data. And you can see our um, national data for lab hysterectomy was 72, and it's about 7,300. And our Providence robot hysterectomy cost as of 2013 was 7,600. So we are a little about $400 above the national cost. And if you look at it, we are cutting the cost down. I bet this year it's even lower. And I bet we're going to be pretty close to what the national laparoscopy hysterectomy costs are. So at individual basis with education, our goal was to prove this. Actually, one of my problems is there is a lot of material for the um, publications, but having time to do that stuff, we have another physician I kind of recruited to see if he can publish this data with my name on it with him and our resident together. And I'm hoping in the next four or five months we'll be able to complete that because this is an important thing for people to know. Education matters, individual physician, understanding of cost matters, and that's how we reduce the cost. So it's the national data and our data is the same for the length of stay. And what is the controversy is all about? It's about complications nationally at the, at the, at the, at the national level, for at least at the, in the states. And the equipment failure, are we reporting all the equipment failures appropriately? Because there is the concern about the, you know, if anybody is learning it, and you know between the bovi and the cartridge and the instrument is there, first of all, you have to make sure your instruments are in your field. If your instruments are not in field because you don't have the tactile sensation, if you don't see them, you don't know where they're moving, they could be in some other organ that could be major trauma. So absolutely essential to make sure your, your instruments are in the visual field where you're doing the procedure. Please stop the procedure before you do manipulate any instruments if you don't see them, okay. And cost versus the benefit. What is the cost of doing the surgery and are we benefiting our patients? Like I said, minimally invasive surgery, I think a couple of surgeons came and said, God, I'm not too comfortable changing it. Don't change it if you're really doing a great, you're a skilled laparoscopy surgeon, you are doing very complex cases, you're not changing any, you cannot change any abdominal to the minimally invasive, don't change it, you know, because you're already there. You don't have to change it. It is people who really are unable to do that. And those people who can learn those skills and go from abdominal to convert into minimally invasive, then do it. But don't do it otherwise. Don't go into the things that you don't have to change. Yeah, and because there is that cost benefit, and even if you put it all together, you're spending about $2 million for each um, uh, robotic. I'm not saying we should not, because I'm a proponent of robotic. Like I said, we have a lot of morbidly obese patients. We have very, very high numbers of morbidly obese patients. And we have obesity rate is extremely high. We have a lot of patients with multiple surgeries. They all have gallbladders out. They all have apis out. They all have at least few cesarean sections, if not one. And so with that, that is the kind of cases that I feel like I want to do robotic surgery. That's why I pushed it. But physicians who feel they're very skilled, I don't think they need to change. The fourth thing that happened in the, at the, in the state's level is the vendor image. There's a concern about marketing techniques and all that stuff, and that created a negative impact, though there's really a positive thing that we're all doing for our patients, and we are trying to convert them to, by, by doing these kind of studies. 
telling them that what we are doing is important, our patients are being benefited. And media, of course, in, in uh, I don't know how it is media here, most probably it is the same like everywhere else now, is once they find out there is a, this Wall Street uh, traded company and there is some issues with it, they kind of media kind of goes after them and that creates a lot of controversy and now our patients look at it and say, my God, you're doing with robot. Now I hear all these possible complications. So first of all, for all my cases, irrespective of what kind of surgeries I do, we have informed consent. Every case has an informed consent. That I have been doing it for 35 years. Every single patient gets informed consent. Whether it's a DNC hysteroscopy, whether we do ablations, whether we do do bladder slings, whether we do myomectomy, everything has informed consent. So we make sure the patients are aware, they're informed about what the risks are and what the benefits, what are the possible concerns, and are they willing to take that risk. And you always have to weigh the benefits and risks for each surgery. And you have to give, as an expert, give them your idea, what is the benefit and what is the risk, and they have to come up with an answer ultimately. And because of the FDA warning, we are extremely uh, very, very aware of it with the myomectomies, and we are really looking at different options of how we go about it, and uh, are we going to do more abdominal? Is it fair? No, it's not fair. It's about one in 350 hysterectomies might have leiomyosarcomas. Now, the question is, if you have leiomyosarcoma, if you do the power modulation on these myomas, would it change the staging of the disease and the outcome of the patients? Now, the question, there's some that are saying yes, but I think there is, needs to be more literature more studies because now it became a focus. Until now, most of our benign gynecology surgeons felt, oh, lyomyoma is 99.9, .9, but they are not cancerous, so we don't worry about it as much. But you have to remember, you have to be, you have to be very cognizant, postmenopausal, perimenopausal, rapid growth. Those kind of patients you don't want to do modulation. Now, however you do it, unless it's a contained situation, even vaginal modulation, you have to put it in a bag or something like that because you have to be careful in those patients, you are taking more risk. So finally, uh, what, uh, what our project conclusion was, over 60% of hysterectomies were done by minimal invasive approach. And we saw, the, we saw a significant benefits from focused physician education. So major surgical complications, as I mentioned already, they're similar to national data. And no change in the surgical times in the past two years and significant reduction in their cost. That's what you have to really change the conversation. How do we keep the quality up and keep the cost down? And once the costs come down, naturally, there are more adaptability to these procedures with robotic surgery. I can bet with you most of the physicians are not very big skilled laparoscopy surgeons. There are some they are, but there might be a lot more patients out there getting open surgeries that they don't need to get, and the recovery is much longer. And so as we proved that it is closer to laparoscopy cause. And uh, so we know that minimally invasive surgery is more beneficial to the woman. And we also need to focus on societal benefits. I'm not sure how many working women, most probably there are a lot of them are working women in India too now. I'm not sure about even that. Even if they're not working, the mother is a very important Very important factor at home, absolutely. Yeah. And so and the, yeah. yeah. So that is a, there's something is societal, either monetary value or value at home, what they have to do and what they have to really accomplish. I think doing minimally invasive surgery makes a big difference for them. It's a societal benefit as a whole. With that, I don't think I have, this concludes my presentation. Thank you.